you know, if you take people, and I've told you this, and you expose them voluntarily to things that they are avoiding and are afraid of, you know, that they know they need to overcome in order to meet their goals, the self-defined goals. If you can teach people to stand up in the face of the things they're afraid of, they get stronger. If you're gonna be a fighter, you have to wanna to win and you have to wanna to hurt people. I mean, not for the sake of hurting them, that's what makes you different than an evil person. But you have to have that capacity, you have to develop that. And you know, that's the step on the way to enlightenment, weirdly enough, because that isn't what people think. Someone who is incapable of cruelty is a higher moral being than someone who is capable of cruelty. And I would say, and this follows Jung as well, that that's incorrect and it's dangerously incorrect because if you are not capable of cruelty, you are absolutely a victim to anyone who is. And so part of the reason that people go watch anti-heroes and villains is because there's a part of them crying out for the incorporation of the monster within them which is what gives them strength of character and self-respect because it's impossible to respect yourself until you grow teeth if you're harmless you're not virtuous you're just harmless you're like a rabbit a rabbit isn't virtuous it's just it just can't do anything except get eaten it's not virtuous if you're a monster and you don't act monstrously, then you're virtuous. But you also have to be a monster. Well, you see this all the time. Harry Potter's like that too. It's like he's, he's flawed, he's hurt, he's got evil in him. He can talk to snakes, man. He breaks rules all the time, all the time. He's not obedient at all. But you know, he has a good reason for breaking the rules. And if he couldn't break the rules, him and his little clique of rule-breaking, you know, troublemakers, if they didn't break the rules, they wouldn't attain the highest goal. So it's very peculiar, but it's a very, 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 very common mythological notion. You know, the hero has to be, the hero has to be a monster, but a controlled monster. Batman is like that, you know, I mean, it's, it's everywhere. It's, it's the story you always hear. And if you grow teeth, then you realize that you're somewhat dangerous or maybe somewhat seriously dangerous, and then you might be more willing to demand that you treat yourself with respect and other people do the same thing. And so that doesn't mean that being cruel is better than not being cruel. What it means is that being able to be cruel and then not being cruel is better than not being able to be cruel. Because in the first case, you're nothing but weak and naive. And in the second case, you're dangerous but you have it under control. And you know, a lot of martial arts concentrate on exactly that as part of their philosophy of training. It's like, we're not training you to fight. We're training you to be peaceful and awake and avoid fights. But if you happen to have to get in one, and I guess the philosophy also is, is that if you're competent at fighting, that actually decreases the probability that you're going to have to fight because when someone pushes you, you'll be able to respond with confidence and with any luck, and this is certainly the case with bullies, with any luck, a reasonable show of confidence, which is very much equivalent to a show of dominance, is going to be enough to make the bully back off. What could you do to improve yourself? Well, let, let's step one step backwards. The first question might be, why should you even bother improving yourself? And I think the answer to that is something like, so you don't suffer any more stupidly than you have to. And maybe so others don't have to either. It's something like that. You know, like there's a real injunction at the bottom of it. It's not some casual self-help doctrine. It's that if you don't organize yourself properly, you'll pay for it and in a big way, and so will the people around you. And you could say, well, I don't care about that, but that's actually not true. You actually do care about that, because if you're in pain, you will care about it. And so you do care about it, even if it's just that negative way, you know. It's very rare that you can find someone who's in excruciating pain who would ever say, well, it would be no better if I was out of this. Sort of pain is one of those things that brings the idea that it would be better if it didn't exist along with it. It's incontrovertible. So you get your act together so that there isn't any more stupid pain around you than necessary. 
Things are tragic and difficult, but there's always some stupid thing that you could do that could make it even worse than it has to be. So that's life. And you need an antidote to that because that can embitter you. You ask a disagreeable person what he wants, say, or she wants, they'll tell you right away. They, they know. It's like, this is what I want and this is how I'm going to get it. But agreeable people, especially if they're really agreeable, are so agreeable that they often don't even know what they want because they're so accustomed to living for other people and to finding out what other people want and to trying to make them comfortable and so forth that it's harder for them to find a sense of their own desires as they move through life. Look, there's situations where that's advantageous, but it's certainly not advantageous if you're going to try to forge yourself a career. That just doesn't work at all. I think it's best sort of conceptualized as a, as a trading game. So let's say that we're going to play repeated trading games. And if you're very agreeable, then you're going to bargain harder on my behalf than you're going to bargain on your own behalf. Whereas if you're very disagreeable, you're going to do the reverse. You're going to think, I'm in this trading game for me, and you're going to take care of your own interests. Where an agreeable person is going to say, no, no, at worst, this has to be 50-50, but I'd like to help you every way I can. One of the things you have to be careful of if you're agreeable is not to be exploited because you'll line up to be exploited. And I think the reason for that is because you're wired to be exploited by infants. And one of the things I tell agreeable people, especially if they're conscientious, is say what you think. Tell the truth about what you think. There's going to be things you think that you think are nasty and harsh. And they probably are nasty and harsh, but they're also probably true. And you need to bring those up to the forefront and deliver the message. And it's not straightforward at all because agreeable people do not like conflict. Not at all. They smooth the water. The problem with that is it's not a very good medium to long-term strategy because lots, lots of times there are things you have to talk about because they're not going to go away. And the advantage to having a well-socialized, disagreeable person is that they really don't let much get in their way. So if you can get a kid who's disagreeable socialized, that person can be quite the creature. You know? And that ties yeah. into our, what we'll discuss in relationship to the dark triad because there's some mystery about why women seem to be attracted to these so-called dark triad traits. And I would say that they're using them as insufficient markers for the ability to or the acquisition of status. So, and narcissists capitalize on that, right? Because a narcissist looks yeah. confident and yes. lots of confident people are competent, but some confident people aren't competent, but they can <laughs> fool you. Yes. And then I think the other explanation is that if you had to choose between a benefit conferrer who could punish free riders and one who couldn't, you should pick the former. If you're more compassionate, more empathic, you're going to feel the hunger of other people and you'd be more motivated to, to care for them, let's say. But it's also possible that that low agreeableness has something to do with, well, perhaps hunting prowess. That might be part of it. And so women are in a conundrum with agreeableness, right? Because they need a mate who's agreeable enough so they can bond with them and that will care for their children and it cares in general. But they need someone who's disagreeable enough so that they're capable, let's say, of dealing with free riders. Women are attracted to some degree to the lower agreeable types and I think that accounts for the bad boy paradox that you described at least in part.